sort of like guts. Treat, perseverance and stubbornness. Even though it seems from the first hour of the war that you are going to lose this battle. No matter how bad it's going. You won't give up in any circumstances. It's not about war and battle. It's about living in Finland. Hard winters, lots of suffering in the Finnish history. And the whole nation has held it together. And maybe Sisu is the explanation for that. <laughs>
we used to have a very good relation with Russia as well. It was something we were kind of proud of also, that we are able to cooperate, but now after this full-blown war of Ukraine, it has made us also to feel very insecure in Finland. And that's why we have received a tremendous amount of new, uh, new people participating in these service organizations and so on. So I would answer that geography is, it, it poses us some, some challenges that perhaps British people, for example, cannot uh, understand as such easily. Unbelievable. That good. was very good. Finland is one of the few countries in Europe which still operates a policy of mandatory military service for all men. Conscription means the small Nordic country of just 5.5 million people can muster one of the largest reserve armies in the world. These citizen soldiers are often members of reservist organizations which run voluntary training events like this shooting competition. Since Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine, Finns have been flocking to attend refresher courses in everything from shooting to anti-tank techniques and basic survival skills. At the beginning of this year our club was roughly 1,000 members and now it's close to 1,450. So 450 more. I have talked with them and the honest answer from them is that they join us because of the security issue and the Ukraine. Antti Ketunen is chairman of the Vanta Reservists Club. Now a salesman, he did his mandatory service between 1997 and 1998. Since then, he's made sure to stay battle ready. It's healthy to know that you can shoot the 40 centimeter target up to 500 meters. It's a needful skill like swimming. If you have to drop from the boat, you have, need to know how to swim back to the boat. I wish that everybody know how to shoot. Could be a useful skill one day. If you need to shoot, shoot. If you need to talk, talk. It's better to be a samurai in the garden than a garden in the war. Defending our country is uh, really kind of uh, deep-rooted in our values. It is our duty and also that it is totally normal to think about what happens if I need to uh, defend my country. Yari Leiner is CEO of military and outdoor supply company Varustileka. Since Putin launched his war in Ukraine, he's seen demand skyrocket in his stores. After the, the attack, it's been crazy. Some of the categories like first aid, combat gear, all the field gear, they have grown hundreds of percentages compared to the same period of time last year. So yeah, it, it kind of exploded. One item which has been kind of really popular like past few months has been the, the basic plate carrier. Uh, the, the west base where you can put the, the protective plates in, in and then have the, the pouches for uh, for a magazine and then on the sides you can attach for example pouches for tourniquet and first aid kit and radio and so forth. So this has been a, a top seller and in conjunction with uh, we, sell, we have sold a lot of uh, protective plates uh, for with the different uh, protection levels. That particular uh, plate one is the, the rating for that, which is the, uh, old, uh, the NATO 762 caliber. So pretty powerful uh, uh, bullet would this particular plate would uh, stop. So here we have uh, one example on a mannequin, like uh, basic uh, combat clothing, combat boots, load bearing belt. You could mount the, the uh, pouches and, and the pistol there and then basic load bearing vest, the chest trick, where you can carry few magazines, maybe the, the first aid kit. Another like popular item, what we're selling a lot is the, the helmets, uh, protects from uh, shrapnel and uh, handgun projectiles. You can mount the night vision there, you can have your uh, communications and ear protection. Many of the items, uh, especially in Finland, uh, are used by uh, reservists or active duty soldiers. Even though the government is offering, of course they are issuing you a kit, 
but uh, many of the uh, reservist and active duty personnel are upgrading their kit to be more effective in, in their uh, line of duty. And uh, that, that's a big part of our, our business, uh, what we do. Not all the items are being bought by the Finnish for the Finnish though. Some are being sent to Ukraine to be used on the front line. Some are being bought by other Europeans, in particular from people in Sweden and Germany, where sales are up 40% on last year. It's no news for, at least for a majority of the Finns, that Russia might be aggressive towards their neighboring countries. I think people have been like, okay, that was a wake up call that maybe now I need to get in a shape and make sure that I have the right gear and I have the right training if something happens. But it's pretty hard to be happy about the, the sales increase due to the, the Russian attack to uh, Ukraine. I'm really angry about it. Ukraine is, is a sovereign country. They, they just want to live their life. They are not bothering Russians or anyone else. So I, I don't see any justification for that type of violence. And I just hope that uh, the Russian forces would be driven back to Moscow and we could isolate the Russia totally from the uh, world. And maybe they could kind of apply world membership after 2000 years, but yeah. That's how I feel. <laughs> I think Finland is really well uh, prepared and, and the willingness to protect this country is really high. So I think if there would be a similar kind of a development in, in things, it would be really bad for Russian troops. They will be probably wiped out. The key weapon system of the Finnish defense is the uh, willingness uh, to defend our own country. If you want peace, you have to prepare for war. On Helsinki's island military base of Santa Hermina, a fresh batch of conscripts are taking their oath of allegiance. Observing is Jan Makatalo, military professor of operational art and tactics at the National Defence University. This uh, military oath is a very symbolic uh, event. They give their oath promising uh, that they will defend Finland with all the strengths that they have. Even if it requires the ultimate sacrifice, they commit to that. This conscript army is the backbone of Finland's all-encompassing defence system, known as comprehensive security. It basically means that in the event of an invasion, the entire Finnish society can be mobilised to resist. This was our experience from the Second World War. Because we are a small country, we are not able to maintain a large number army in peacetime. And in the wartime, we have to have a system that all the power all the forces of us, our society is directed uh, for the defense of Finland. When the Soviet Union collapsed uh, in, in the beginning of 1990s and the Cold War ended, most of the European countries abolished their large-scale armies. They ended the uh, general conscription service. They sold lots of material, for example, Netherlands gave up the whole uh, armoured force and we bought it. As a small country, we knew that we should have a readiness because we have our historical background being a neighbour with Russia, Soviet Union. We can't afford to lose the infrastructure of the large-scale army. We are not able to rebuild it in a short time. That's why we maintained it and we kept the structure, the backbone intact and now I think it was a very well done decision made by our politicians and, and our top generals back then. So, what is that structure? Finland's military is made up of a total of 900,000 reservists, of which 280,000 can be mustered to form a wartime strength. Of that 280,000, only 3% are full-time professional military personnel, just 23,000 people. 
On land, Finland has 200 tanks, more than 2,000 armoured vehicles, over 100 self-propelled artillery pieces and more than 600 towed artillery weapons. In the air, the majority of their strength lies in the 50 single-seat FA-18C Hornets. But by 2030, Finland plans to have procured 64 Lockheed F-35 fighter jets in a deal which was sealed in late 2021. Most of the Finnish soil is still a forest with thick trees, rocks, difficult terrain for tanks to operate. And the whole tactics, whole operational art, whole doctrine of, of Finnish Defence Forces, it's planned according to that, to take advantage of those features of our terrain. If there would be a surprise attack, we have certain readiness forces which are prepared to give the first strike, to hit hard, to hit fast. We have uh, forces which are able to delay uh, the enemy. They are the new uh, local forces that we are uh, recreating and giving more strength to them. The local forces, they, they are like an anvil. And then we ha have operational forces which are like a sledgehammer. And they hit together and the Hopefully the enemy will be between them and we think that that will be the end of the war. The return of war to Europe has led to a major boost to Finland's military budget, with the government promising to increase defence spending by 2.2 billion euro over the next four years. Putin's onslaught has also led to one of the most significant U-turns in recent Finnish history, reversing decades of military non-alignment in a country sat slap bang between East and West. I warmly welcome the requests by Finland and Sweden to join NATO. NATO, or the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, is a defensive pact signed in the aftermath of World War II between the initial 12 countries. In this treaty, we seek to establish freedom from aggression and from the use of force in the North Atlantic community. Over the intervening decades, the alliance has swelled to include 30 nations, stretching from the US Alaskan coast to Turkey in the east. The critical component to the alliance is Article 5, which states that an armed attack against one or more NATO countries shall be considered an attack against them all. It's a security guarantee that, up until now, a majority of the Finnish people were opposed to. But Russia's actions have flipped public opinion on its head. If a neighbour of Russia, Ukraine, had an even larger army than Finland had, and they are brother nations, Russians and Ukrainians, if, if Russia is able and willing to attack Ukraine, perhaps we have to rethink the whole picture again. In addition to the disaster that Russia has now in Ukraine, the, actions of Finland and Sweden has, had been the second loss of Russia. They didn't expect us to act like this. So I think our president said it very well in his speech. He said that you, you caused, caused this. Look at the mirror. The benefits of membership for Finland are obvious, but what will NATO gain from its newest applicant? They will not get a country which is expecting all the help. We are able to defend ourselves. I think we have those kind of qualities that not so many NATO countries uh, right now have. A large reserve, joint fire ability, air-to-ground capabilities, long-range artillery and uh, rocket fire systems. We are able to defend our country even by ourselves. This is sort of additional assurance. I think our capabilities, they will increase peace in, in Scandinavia and in, in the northern flank of NATO. Just inside the Arctic Circle is Western Europe's largest military training area. Here, amongst 1,200 square kilometers of Lapland forest, I'm about to witness proof of that sentiment.
These 48-ton South Korean manufactured K9 Thunder howitzers can launch a 150mm caliber projectile up to 40 kilometers at maximum range. And when that payload lands, it's capable of destroying an area between 50 and 100 meters wide. Each of these tanks is crewed by five soldiers. For all but one, their attendance is mandatory. The only person here purely out of choice is 21-year-old Sophie Hagman. I think it's really important that everyone should defend our country in their own way. And I wanted to do it in a military service. Women can volunteer to serve if they're between the ages of 18 and 29. And since 1995, more than 10,000 Finnish women have done just that. I want to defend my country in, my, in the military service. And my father is a peacekeeper. So. The Amos Mortal system is a Finnish made system and the vehicle has two 120 mm mortar tubes on the, on the turret. We have five, uh, five salvos, so ten grenades from this position. The Amos or Advanced Mortar system is crewed by a team of four and has a maximum range of 10 kilometers. These may just be exercises, but for the conscripts, the real-world unpredictability to the east is hard to ignore. Our neighbor is kind of threat sometimes and can be unpredictable. You never know what's going to happen. Where, the, where we are located, it's, well, you know, you see where the world is right now. So. Of course, the current situation in the world, the war hasn't been quite closer in many years. Sometimes I think think about it, but I try to not think about it too much. I stress myself out. I think it's important that everyone carries their duty, and uh, we are here to defend our land as best as we can. I don't think a lot of people before the situation in Ukraine really thought that a large-scale war like that would ever happen again. But now it's made you realize that it is still possible that we might have to actually use these weapons at some point. Of course, we all hope we don't have to, but it, it makes you think. I think this is the job I, I would gladly do for my country, if need be, and I'd be prepared to do it as well. Of course, I'm not saying that I wouldn't be scared. Of course I would, but... I'm prepared that if I need to, I'm ready. Finland's generally anxious approach to national security isn't without historical justification. It runs deep in our gene pool, the memory of World War II, because I think Finland lost something like 90,000 soldiers, so it's still very alive, alive among the Finnish people. It runs deep in our, our collective memory. In November 1939, around a million troops of the Soviet Union's Red Army crossed into Finnish territory, beginning what is known as the Winter War. Right over there, you can see a, a Finnish border soldier from the Winter War. He's wearing a captured Soviet light machine gun as his personal weapon, and he's also wearing on his belt a famous Molotov cocktail, the improvised anti-tank defense device. Despite being vastly outnumbered, the Finnish forces managed to stave off the Soviets for three months and inflicted devastating losses on the invading Russians. But eventually, the Soviet Union's overwhelming manpower crushed the resistance, and the 1940 Moscow Treaty was signed, which ceded some 10% of Finnish territory to Stalin. Exactly the same scenario is going on over there in the Ukraine, which uh, happened here over 80 years ago. So the whole population uh, was mobilized here, and, and we, we see the very same thing happening in the Ukraine also. We always knew that maybe someday the Russian bear uh, finds its strength again. So it would be crazy or even suicidal to, to put down our defenses. 
5,977. That's the estimated number of nuclear weapons currently in Russia's arsenal. It's the biggest stockpile in the world, around 500 more than second place holder, the United States. Since they were last used in combat in 1945, the power, precision and strike speed of the world's nuclear weapons has increased dramatically. Russia's intercontinental ballistic missiles are fast enough to reach London in 20 minutes and powerful enough to destroy it entirely. And the Russian state isn't shy about threatening to use them. If there are any sane people left in NATO, they will not approve a peacekeeping operation in Ukraine. Why? Because a collective NATO decision will mean a de facto declaration of war on Russia. To win this war, whether we like it or not, we will have to use tactical nuclear weapons in the theatre of operations. Since the war in Ukraine began, a steady stream of nuclear saber rattling from the Kremlin has heightened atomic anxiety in a way not seen since the Cold War. But for Finland, living right next to the world's biggest store of nukes and not a nuclear power itself, the threat of devastation is something the country has faced down for decades. War is, is one, th one thing that is on our threat assessment. It is most likely not to happen, but it still is a threat. Uh, if the war happens to Finland, the effect to the people are so enormous that we need to take some measures against it. Buried deep into Helsinki's billion-year-old bedrock is a sports centre, car park, kids' playground, and if the need arises, a 6,000-bed nuclear bunker able to survive an atomic bullseye. The first barrier of the safety is the corridor where you came in. It is descending and it is curving, so it, the corridor itself takes the most of the blast away. And after that, there is firstly uh, the blast-proof barricade, and after that there is a gas-proof barricade. Any known uh, uh, weapon effects should be on our range, even direct heat. The Merry Haka shelter is 25 metres below ground and can be transformed from a leisure centre into a life-saving hideaway in 72 hours. So this is the, one of the main sheltering halls. All these halls are divided in smaller uh, sheltering rooms by uh, light equipment and by light structures to keep uh, the person uh, to feeling as secure, as secure as possible. So this is one specimen of, of the toilet unit and so all the markings on the floor should uh, contain one, one unit. It is just a plastic bag. Just a plastic bag. The unit is uh, con uh, connected to the uh, ventilation system, so the odors of the toilet mostly go out of, outside of the shelter. 6,000 persons, there would be a lot of odors. Secure? Yes. Safe? Yes. But comfortable? Well, probably not. We don't provide food. We provide air and water and shelter. And that's it. We can survive without air approximately three minutes, and we can survive without water approximately three days, and we can survive without food approximately three weeks. This isn't a hotel. We don't have a breakfast buffet. No Netflix, eh? No, sorry, sorry. In Helsinki alone, there are around 5,500 shelters with enough space for 900,000 people, 250,000 more than the population to account for commuters and tourists. The entire country has some 50,000 bomb shelters, most of them private. By law, any building in Finland over 1,200 square meters must be built with a shelter, meaning many of them have dual uses. Metro stations, swimming pools, gyms, skate parks, and in the north, in Lapland, even Santa's grotto can be converted into a bomb shelter. As well as being able to absorb a direct nuclear strike, engineers have constructed the Mary Haka shelter to withstand the aftermath of an attack as well. Radiation comes in two forms, straight radiation and fallout radiation. So we can filter out the fallout with the ventilation system on, on filters, but the straight radiation is uh, absorbed to the uh, bedrock. If we know there's possible of contamination, 
uh, on, on the city. Uh, we need to con decontaminate contaminated persons that are coming inside of the shelter uh, with water and, and brushes and, and soap. One thing that can't be planned for is the psychological stress of locking 6,000 frightened people underground for an indeterminate period. The most common thing for everyone inside of the shelter is the fear. And the fear is universal. It doesn't divide us by uh, color of our skin or, or uh, by our religion or, or by, our, by the way we talk or, or the language. Uh, it is universal and, and it, it's, it is joint. Uh, the fear unites us. Like Helsinki's bunkers, the will to survive is something deep and unshakable that holds Finnish society together. This instinct can be encapsulated by a word that has no literal translation in English. Sisu, ah, no. It's kind of combination of grit, perseverance and stubbornness. Kind of put those in a, in a bag and mix it, and I think that's the closest where you can get with Sisu. It's not about war and battle. This same Sisu, it's it's about living in Finland, hard winters, uh, lots of uh, suffering in the Finnish history, and the whole nation has held it together. And, and maybe that's. Sort of Maybe Sisu is the explanation for that. I think Sisu means that in a, in a wartime situation we would fight like hell because we know that we are fighting for our homes and our loved ones and we are fighting for a good cause, for, for the right cause. And during peacetime we keep calm and, and just go, go on living. We don't get nervous, we don't panic at all. We try to adapt. That's Sisu for me in a nutshell guts, so to speak. Not giving up no matter how bad it's going, you know. It, it could be going all wrong, but you're just going to push through because you have the will. It's the will to try no matter what. Perseverance, uh, some kind of courage, some kind of, of uh, uh, keeping your own head, um, standing your ground.